So, welcome to today's session on the approach to property investment. I'm Monica Burns and I'm Head of Member Relations for the National Housing Federation and I'm joined here today with Mandy Elliott who's the Chief Executive of Crosby Housing Association. So you're watching this on demand so there won't be any opportunity for live questions but if you do have any questions please email them to Michelle Tanya. That's michelle.tanya which is T-A-L-L-N-E-R at housing.org.uk. Now, Mandy is going to take us through their journey to develop their asset management plan. So the aims of um, the asset management process that Mandy organised for her organisation was to produce a good quality service resulting in high rates of satisfaction whilst using small, independent, local firms. They wanted a partnership that leads to improved efficiency to Crosby Housing Association and improved service to the customer which is fantastic. It's a really interesting presentation. Mandy's presentation also includes fire risk assessment details and fire upgrading programme, which is obviously very relevant and important today. So over to Mandy for your presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Monica. Um, I'm delighted to be able to talk about our system um, to, to a wider audience today. Um, if I, if I start first off by, I feel like it's almost an apology, but it shouldn't be. Um, when, when my children were little, I used to read them a book called Fancy Nancy and the Bathroom Plant. And we got into the habit of saying, oh, that's Fancy Nancy, or this is not Fancy Nancy. So by way of explanation, I want to just point out to, to the audience that this presentation is by no way Fancy Nancy. We've got no comms team here, so it's literally me, the PowerPoint, uh, and a bit of smart art thrown in. So hopefully you can bear with me as we go through the presentation. So this is describing a journey that we took uh, over a number of years, really, um, and resulted in new contracts that we let last year. First of all, who are we? So Crosby Housing Association is a community-based housing association founded in 1969. So we're just over 50 years old. Uh, rooted in the same community all of that time. We've got 13 staff, 11.8 uh, full-time equivalents, and a team called Chart. And Chart are a, um, a team that are funded by the local authority and the CCG, the clinical commissioning groups to work with clients suffering from severe and enduring mental illness, but to focus on accommodation issues for those people. So they might look at things around move on, for uh, people in supported accommodation, or certainly chaotic individuals that are presenting in hospitals and trying to find accommodation solutions for them. We've got 440 units and we count every one. All of them bar two are within three miles of the office. And we've also got two train stations in between our two neighborhoods. So all are accessible and accessible on foot if, if necessary. Um, all bar one are in the, in the local authority of Sefton. And we've got one property that is in Liverpool. Um, and last year and the year before, we also took on a property in Southport. So that's sort of, the, we, we operate in South Sefton. We took one on in North Sefton and we took one on in Liverpool, which almost felt as though we were branching out to the continent. Um, the, the scheme that we took on in Liverpool was a scheme, again, we've, we've got um, quite a, a significant 17, 18% of our stock focuses on supported housing. And this was a scheme that we developed in partnership with um, the NHS England and Her Majesty's Prison and Probation Service to work with offenders with personality disorder. And it was a bespoke building that had formerly been a uh, probation hostel, which was the reason why we opted for a building in Liverpool. In terms of our stock, it's predominantly old, it's Victorian, it's uh, a mixture of conversions with, with flats. 
we've got some, we, we still call it our, our new build scheme, our new stock, but it was handed over in 1993. So it's not that new now, but it's still new to us. And like I said, we've got a range of supported accommodation, some with 24 hour support, some um, with, well, most of it's with 24 hour support because it's, it's quite significant needs in the, in the client groups. Other than the supported side, our client profile is pretty mixed. So we've got a mixed, mixture of age groups. Um, what I would say is that our client profile is definitely focused on vulnerable. So we've got a, you know, all of, all of the, um, the, the, the things that people will suffer, illness, um, unemployment, poverty levels, um, that's predominantly what we, we haven't got an awful lot of economically mobile um, tenants in our stock. And I suppose the other thing about us that is uh, slightly different is that we also have a charity shop. And that charity shop is as old as we are and actually purchased the, or, or raised the funding for the first property that Crosby Housing purchased. And over the years, it's, it's contributed to our stock probably by around another four units. Who am I? Um, I've worked in the housing sector for over four decades. Uh, working for housing associations and for those of you who remember the housing corporation. In the housing corporation I worked in every section that they had um, and was I left as a manager, a regulation manager, but I'd been an investment manager, a program manager, um, I'd worked in finance before that so um, I had good all-round experience in, in the housing corporation. Um, we are a community-based housing association, but we also want to take part in, in everything that's going on at a national level. So I'm also a member of the National Housing Federation Smaller Housing Association panel. Uh, up until two years ago, I chaired that panel for a number of years. We also work closely with our local authority. We, we have extremely good relationships with our local authority and sit on some of the bespoke groups. So Sefton is on the coast. Um, one of our key aims at Crosby is to promote the coast for the benefit of Sefton um, and actually to build up the significance of the high street because what we find is people go to the coast in Sefton but not enough of them make it up to the high street. And bearing in mind that we're looking at our tenants access into employment as being at a, probably an entry level. We see the high street as a source of employment prospects for our tenants, so it's in our, our interest to try and build that up. We also work in collaboration with a number of other community housing associations across the Northwest, so there's about 13 of us in total. So that's what Chamwar is, Community Housing Associations Northwest. And here we share ideas, we try and commission uh, we've done two successful things in that partnership. We've set up a training arm, and so we offer conferences where for smaller housing associations wouldn't be viable. So we have a tenants conference, we have a governance conference, and we have an all staff conference, as well as bespoke training sessions that we procure uh, ac across our organizations. We are also a close uh, partner with Sefton CVS, which is the uh, community based voluntary sector. Uh, and work with the CCG on the Voluntary Sector Provider Alliance. That's a flavour of what we do. So to the, to the point that we've come here for, so our journey to improved asset management goes way back to 2013. <clears throat> and it was driven by the board. Um, we had a, an extremely astute board member who was the director of the HSE. And he was instrumental in uh, amplifying the significance of our landlord responsibility and keeping tenants safe. So our journey started way back then. And what we did at that, at that stage was to do what, what probably now are known as fire risk assessments. But we did a fire risk assessment on all of our stock. And we developed a fire safety upgrade program at that time, which was stretched over, I think it was three or four years. Um, we developed a standard uh, which we 
believed was above the requirements at the time. So we adopted a new standard called LaCause. Um, and we, we wanted to build on this as we were going forward to increase the scope to cover wider compliance areas. In terms of our strategic themes that have been developed going forward, in terms, assets has always been a key strand of our, uh, our strategic role. So, and we wanted to do a number of things. We wanted to seek new methods to define investment needs. Um, we wanted to improve accountability. One of the things that we struggled with was, was accurate and timely management reporting so that was something that we were definitely looking to improve we wanted to improve data intelligence so that we could refine our investment approach to our existing homes um, and also to build in new and developing areas environmental affordability um, and and as i say develop tools to improve the reporting of those and all along the, the, the side theme of making sure that those, in, those assets were giving us a return on our investment. So when we were looking at moving forward with our, um, our new proposals, we wanted to seek new contractors, work with the new contractors to manage performance excellence. So it's very much a partnership here. It wasn't about trying to offload a job to somebody through a, through a tender contract and then just holding them to account. We would do, we would do the holding to account, but we wanted to actually become uh, a partner in that process. There was a key requirement to demonstrate safety in tenants' homes, and that goes back to the management information. So whilst we knew that we had the data that could uh, prove that we'd done the fire risk assessments, that we had the uh, necessary documents in place. It was really clunky to get that information out and to, to be a, give it a sleek uh, and fast reporting mechanism. We wanted to be able to communicate much more effectively our strategy and more importantly the results of that strategy to our customers. So whilst they could see what we were doing, we wanted to be able to turn that back around and be able to show them in simple terms uh, what we had done. And we also wanted to be able to demonstrate compliance in all safety areas. Other influences in terms of the changes that we made. So we've had rising costs in maintenance over recent years and I know that was that's a sector thing, it's not just down to us. Management reporting, you will see as a theme throughout all of this, we needed to have much better control uh, and management of the reporting systems. We wanted to have a greater emphasis on compliance and evidence. And you've got to, to, to remember that this was not, this was pre-Grenfell, this is not post-Grenfell. So we were wanting to bring those things up the agenda at that point. I think the thing, that I would say about smaller housing associations and, and the resources that we have, uh, things will take longer. So we probably do get more time to develop and to, and to manage things, but we haven't got the resources either in time or money. So, and we do tend to do a lot of things ourselves. The administration as well as the current system was inefficient and, and that led down to the, to the management information. So what we were doing, we were busy, we were delivering, we knew that the satisfaction was high, but nobody was having the capacity to be able to look down on what we had done, how we'd done it, whether there was a better way to do it, whether we were spending money on the right things. So it was about being able to give ourselves headspace to actually do more analysis rather than just deliver the, deliver the role. When we were planning for change, it, it was by no means easy um, and small things probably have a, a, a long lasting impact on, on us, particularly for the age that we were and the relationships that we developed. So we, we had operated with a number of small independent contractors and many of them were local, but they were one man bands. Um, we operated with manual systems and really 
the burden of the admin was, was too high on those. Um, we, there was absolutely no doubt that tenants were happy. They were happy with what they had. They had a good quality service and they had high satisfaction. So there was a risk we knew that when we implemented any change, we were expecting satisfaction to dip because it was such a big change that we were implementing that um, this, there was going to be some, some gaps in that service. And all of those things mattered. It, they mattered to the board and the board agonised over this local um, contractor um, loss. And the small contractors were, you know, were obviously severely impacted on the decisions that we were going to make. So our aim was to have a partnership that leads to improved efficiency to us and improve service to the customer. And I would say that's probably no different to what any of our contemporaries would, would ask for. Um, I, would, I would say that for us, the partnership element is probably stronger uh, in terms of its priority than maybe uh, for other people because other people may just prioritize the service. So, just to reiterate, we wanted more time for staff to analyze work. Uh, we wanted to be able to plan work programs in, in better time. We wanted great, greater cost certainty um, and an option to negotiate below source. So we'd not used schedule of rates. So we'd gone on quotes and, uh, and prices and tenders and whatever the, the systems we needed to, depending on the size of the job. We were now going to move to schedule of rates and going through the tender gave us the opportunity for people to price uh, as part of their tender at or below the schedule of rates. So we stood a chance of, of getting some cost, uh, cost savings. We wanted flexible appointment system alerts to tenants. So we wanted, wanted this, we, we contacted tenants. Um, we worked between the contractor and our staff to give tenants appointment, but we wanted something that was a little bit more slick, maybe text notifications and things that other people had. One of our key, key requirements was um, that we wanted to have IT integration with the contractor's systems. And that was a massive part of this because that was new to, to all of the parties. So we were keeping our system and they were keeping their system. We weren't buying a new system, but we wanted a mechanism for those systems to talk to each other. And in doing that, our aim was that we always retained our control over our own company records. So if something happened with the contractor, whether there was a liquidation, whether there was a partnership breakdown, whether there was something, we had no risk that our data was held in their systems and that they could walk away with it. So whilst we use their systems to improve the management information, all of the document retention, the dates, uh, and the core information is retained within our systems. And that meant that those intelligent, those systems, those IT systems have to be intelligent to work in real time. And Sasha is our housing management software system. I have to say that Sasha is a small business. It does work with a number of housing associations, a lot of them on the smaller side. But, but by working with Sasha, again, we have, we have a tremendous partnership and a relationship with them. So they saw this as an opportunity to, uh, to welcome this with open arms because they saw this as being something for the future to them. So, it wasn't a question of massive fees and time for changes. They worked alongside us to try and get these systems into place. Um, we wanted to have improved streamlined compliance through increased contract and monitoring reporting. And that wasn't about us increasing the reporting that we do on the contractors. That was about the contractors taking responsibility for compliance and reporting to us. So we would act more like an auditor rather than the, um, taking all of that data and trying to provide that assurance ourselves. One of the other things that was key to us was that we wanted to retain that first point of contact. So CHA would always be the first point of contact with the tenant. 
we were absolutely clear that we didn't want a, a menu option that was ring press one for this two for that listen endlessly to green sleeves or robbie williams or whoever else she decided you wanted to put onto the screen we really did not want to be recognized as a call center and and in some ways that that was different because when when you change over to a lot of these systems those call center facilities are already in there so we were actually changing a system that was working for someone else to tailor it to meet our needs um, and, and i go back to the uh, the anguish that we went through in losing some of our small one-man band contractors and so we put uh, a recommendation within the tender that the contractors had to respond to about using CHA contractors as subcontractors as part of the main contract. I said, I think I, I touched on this earlier on, but we're not ones for going out and paying money to consultants. It's not something that we've got the resource to do. But for this one, because it was, it was a controversial procurement contract, we employed random consultants to prepare the, the tenders. We, we also were slightly different in the way that, that we did it because we could have, and many associations have, gone with one contractor for the whole scope, scope of the works that we deliver. But because compliance was so important to us, we wanted to split it and we wanted a, a specialist contractor who actually believed in the importance of compliance to the same level that we did. So we split the contract into two and we had two tenders that went out at the same time and um, obviously potentially two different contractors, which is what we ended up with. So we, we split the compliance contract from the responsive repairs contract. So this is the compliance contract. So within that, you've got the things that you would expect, but we've got all of the fire safety, emergency lighting, smoke and heat. Um, but we've also got uh, gas, electrical, but door entry systems, firefighting equipment, electronic gates, periodic service of disabled lifts, chair lifts. Um, We've even got things like Legionella. So any, anything that was a, um, either a legal or a regulatory or a safety compliance area, we put into the one contract. And with the gas contract, um, we went for a three-star service. Um, I, I don't know, I think this is, is quite, quite known about across the sector, but somebody here asked me to mention it uh, specifically so what that is it's a bit like an insurance policy so we pay the contractor a price per unit uh, for relevant units across across the piece annually and they will then complete responsive repairs um, I'm not going to say at no cost but it's within the cost of that annual th uh, three-star service price we moved the, everything else into the responsive repairs contract so this was really all of your trade your building your plumbing our most expensive area of work really given the the extensive uh, age profile of our stock and the nature of the buildings um we decided at the beginning that voids would be allocated to cha because we wanted to hold control over certain things um at our discretion we were able to give them planned works and component replacements, but we didn't necessarily guarantee that at the beginning of the tender. So within the tender, we got prices for all of those things. So we can accept those prices as we go through. But if we choose before, for whatever reason that we don't want to give them a planned works program, then we are not obliged to do so. One of the other things that, um, that we did that was probably slightly different and an added um dimension we we weren't satisfied with the out of hours call handling services that were in place for the contractors that bid for the tender and i'm going to give you an example of one whereby we have an out of hours contractor that we've worked with for a number of years uh, we had a tenant that was well 
bordering suicidal. And we get tenants that will ring out of hours, not for a repair. So they will ring and they will be distressed. Um, and our, our, the out of hours service that we have could actually support those people, even just in terms of having a conversation where I know that if we went to many of the sort of larger out of hours services that are working nationally, the, the response would probably be, sorry, that's not a repair. And they would cut that, that tenant dead at that time. So we decided that we wanted to keep our own out of hours service, at least in the short term, so that we could uh, see whether or not we were satisfied with the out of hours service that was, that was uh, being offered as part of the contractor's offer. So the compliance works, the, a lot of the compliance works are periodic. So what we do is we provided the dates and the schedules. So we already had the last service date, the last gas certificate date and so on that we passed over to the contractor. Once they got them, they took over the control of those, uh, put them into programs, um, they man the contractor managed them to comply with legal requirements and best practice. And then they delivered them in accordance with CHA protocols and timescales. The benefit that we got from the compliance contract was that we actually now access the compliance contractor's system so we can see in real time what their work programs are for a day, they, what contact they've had with the tenants, so whether they've written to the tenants, whether they've sent texts to the tenants, there is photographic evidence on the site that uh, we can see. So all of that management information that we were desperately seeking before is all in real time. Um, and so if we do get a call from a tenant, then we've got far more up-to-date um, information to provide to them. The responsive repairs, as I say, all routine repairs, um, the work, there would be some compliance related um, follow on work. Um, and again, the IT systems should be linked. Now we are not as far forward with the responsive repairs IT link as we are with the compliance link. And that has really been stymied through the lockdown period, but it's not something that we are going to um, give up on. It's something that we will go back, we go back to. And again, real time access. We, we do have access to the contractor system so we can see um, the, the way that they're controlling their the visits and, and things. But at the moment, there's more to do on the responsive repairs contract IT. And like I said earlier, we, we still wanted uh, CHA to control the voids and that's at that point. So works in terms of the IT, we wanted, um, we wanted to talk to the tenant, as I said, in the first instance. And so we then make the appointment through the contractor's system uh, for that tenant so that we're, we're trying to keep it as a one call solution. We get photos and certificates, as I've said, works orders and completion dates. So one of the other things that we wanted for our property record was a property um, repairs record. So we've still got a copy of all of the orders um, and all of the information on the payments in each of the, of the property files. So that his, property history we've still retained. And the clear up-to-date real-time management information, you know, I've said that time and time again, but that was such a key driver. So we've still got more to do. Uh, we want to continue to improve the IT links. We still need to streamline staff involvement. So in terms of teething problems at the beginning, I suppose our staff who were used to being very, very hands-on and involved have probably interfered a bit too much. So the contractors are feeling a little bit overwhelmed about you know, inter interfering. So we've still got to streamline that a little bit more. Um, we're thinking, it, uh, we'll, we'll come on to this, but rolling out the voids um, and looking at the process for voids. And obviously, you know, the, the icing on the cake is to increase that data intelligence and system monitoring reporting. So we've seen some great progress in that to date. Uh, and it's just made us hungry for more, really. And we know that there's scope to do more. And that's it. That was really interesting and quite a journey. So thank you for that, Mandy. Really, really interesting. If it's okay if I ask you a few questions, I think we've got about 10 minutes. So 
Um, obviously, as a community-based housing association, it's obvious that you are really committed to local employment and SMEs, um, and that is a really significant piece of this work. Um, could you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, we. I think I've, I've made it on the fact that we lost some of our very local uh, contractors as part of this regime. But the contractors that we're working with are still based within 10 minutes of us, you know, yeah. or, or half an hour of us. Um, so they're still local. Um, and, I, and I think for... Um, it's about relationships for us and, and partnerships, I think. So we, we expect... In my presentation, I didn't major on it, but I talked about the Crosby Way. When we, when we take on a new partnership like this, it's, it's really big for us and, it, and it's really serious for us. And we expect that contractor to take it as seriously as we do. We're not just another job. And they, ha they have to become a member of our team. And being local is part of that. There's no point in them not understanding the geography, not understanding the tenants that we've got. So, and we've got those, we've got those sort of crossover relationships. Um, throughout the process. Yeah, it's, it's great, it sounds brilliant. Um, so moving on from that, like you said, you know, you want the contractors to actually understand the tenants that you're working with and everything. So how do you ensure the variation in service and care that's needed for the specific tenants that you house and the particular properties that you house them in? So, so I suppose that's one reason why we wanted to hold on to that first point of contact. So we, we still can pass on that information to the tenants. And when I talked about the relationships just before, our frontline staff have got a relationship now with their frontline staff. The managers have got a relationship with their managers, MD to MD. We can pick up the phone at any time. We can turn up at any time. So we, we can do that. So we can give really good information, but we've also had the tenant on the phone to us. So we actually will understand at that point whether that tenant is struggling with a particular issue um, and we can, be, we can pass that on. We're also close enough, Monica, that you know, if, any, if there are any issues on site, we can almost be there in real time. So, okay. so, so if it's significant, then we can respond effectively to, to the level of it. Yourselves. That's really good. And obviously, you know, with the lockdown, the pandemic, etc. Have you had to implement many changes to this process because of that? I think, I think um, much the same as everybody else, to be honest. Um, our pl we delayed our pl plan programme. Um, I'm still mindful to deliver that in this year if we can. So I know a lot of associations have decided to defer till the next financial year. Um, but we're looking at ways to see, we've, certainly we've got a bathroom programme um, and we're still looking at ways. And, and before, Sefton's just gone down in, in, into a, a further sort of um, lockdown measure. But before that, we were talking about trying to, to get that launched again in November. So they were deferred, but, we're, but we're, you know, we haven't given up yet. Routine repairs, they, they dropped off. Tenants were very quiet. We were really, you know, being bombarded by the tenants. I think everybody went into sort of a state of shock at the beginning and, and everything did slow down. Um, we, we're starting to pick up, obviously, some issues around that now because some of the responsive work that should have been done uh, is, will lead to, to different problems. The compliance programme continued all the way through. Um, and we had a really good response from tenants on the compliance issue. So we have very, very few access issues. Um, and mainly the, what the access issues that we encountered were to do with people who were shielding. So they just wanted to re rejig the appointment until their shielding period was over. So the compliance program was, you know, continued well. Um, that's excellent. Just, just, just I, I've mentioned voids a couple of times as we go through. One of the things that we did change um, as we went through lockdown was our approach to voids. And we realised that, that we wanted to handle the voids ourselves because we believed that it was a more personal service and we had greater control. But there were far too many steps in the process. 
And so when we were going through lockdown, it became really apparent that they were too difficult to administer. And so we have agreed now that that void programme will go back into um, or will form part of the responsive repairs contract. Oh, that's interesting. That's really interesting. That was triggered by the pandemic as well. Yeah. So, um, so the final question was, was cost a key driver and how is that playing out if it was? So when we started it uh, out on the process, cost wasn't a key driver. I don't think we expected to uh, to save a lot of money through this. The driver was accountability, improved accountability, improved communication, um, and improved management information so that we could manage the service better and understand the service better. And then we, we felt that once we could uh, analyze the, the situation the way that we wanted, we could drive costs down. So it's, it's too soon to say, yes, what the impact of costs is. And this year's a bad year to assess costs because, you know, I could say, yes, we've spent a lot less on our repair service, but it won't be comparable to the level of the, the number of repairs that we've done in the past. So it wasn't a key driver, accountability, management information, and um, improved administration were the key, for, was the key factor. Um, but I don't think it's going to cost any more. Great. Well, thank you very much, Mandy. That was really interesting and a great insight into the journey that you've had and wish you lots of luck um, with your future efforts in this field. It's brilliant. Um, just to reiterate, um, if you want to send any questions, please do so to michelletanya at housing.org.uk. And thank you very much for joining us today. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.